Good morning and welcome to Rise Up 23, Be the Domino. I am so excited to have you with us. Let's just start the day off with some applause, please, for all of us being here. So my name is Judy Grant, and I'm the Director of Equity and Inclusion at Penny Lane Centers. Before I talk about why we are here, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the current situation that is occurring in Israel and Palestine. My heart breaks for the innocent lives that have been lost. In an email thread just last week with Lisa, um, who is our keynote speaker, um, we were sharing about our concerns and our frustrations about the situation, not having any answers. But Lisa, Lisa responded with the following, it truly takes us all coming together to fight these injustices, here and abroad. Yes, Rise Up could not come at a better time. Thank you for that reminder, Lisa. So our thoughts and our prayers go out to all of those folks that have been impacted by that, both here and abroad, because at some part in all of our hearts, we're feeling this. So I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that. So in 2022, we held our very first Rise Up right here. Um, we didn't know who would show up. We didn't know if anyone would be interested in showing up, but you did. 200 of you showed up, and we started the conversation about racial and social justice issues. Today, we're going to continue that conversation. And it's because of your participation, your interest, and your engagement that further validates what we already know to be true. In order for there to be change, we have to start by having these difficult conversations. So when we started thinking about Rise Up 23 and what we were going to do, we started to consider a bunch of different themes. Can you guess what we chose? Hello. I am, <laughs> I am the domino. You are also the domino. The domino came to our minds because of um, just a number of reasons. But the idea of that chain reaction, how one domino will topple the next. The domino effect is a chain reaction that occurs when one event sets, sets out of a series of similar related and connected events. Let us think for a moment of those historical dominoes. Dr. Martin Luther King, Cesar Chavez, Mahatma Gandhi, but there are also some other dominoes that might not be you know, at the forefront of our minds. I think of Oscar Schindler, Dr. Melanie Yazzie, Katherine Johnson. Schindler was a domino as he saved the lives of 1,200 Jews during the Holocaust by employing them at his factory. Dr. Yazzie is a civilian of the Navajo Nation. She's a professor, author, and advocate for all indigenous communities. Katherine Johnson, one of the first African-American NASA scientists. She was a mathematician. Known or not known, these people took a stand and took action, which then rippled throughout their community, their state, and throughout the world. It is because of these dominoes falling that change occurred. I'm thrilled to let each of you know that you also have the power to be a domino. Hi, Corey. It can be a small gesture, a wave to someone that you pass by. It can be something bigger, advocating for a client, becoming an activist in your community. But you too have this power. It's not just reserved for the big names that we hear on the news. We can do this every single day. And by being here today, we are a part of that chain reaction. We all have the potential to be the change that we want to see in the world. Today I'm going to ask you a question, so hold this in your mind as you proceed throughout the course of the day. What are you going to do to be the domino? What, are you, what action steps are you going to take? In advance of that, just hold that question in your mind because we're going to get back to it. But in advance of that, I want to talk to you a little bit about a story that I stumbled upon as I prepared for the day. Initially I wasn't going to read the story. It's actually a poem. But the more I thought about it, the more it resonated with me, and the more I felt, you know what, this is my story. 
But I also realize that this could be your story or your story. And this has an impact on so many of us. Before I actually get to the story, to the poem, I want to give you a little bit about my personal background. As many of you know, I'm a very proud Jamaican. When we immigrated to the United States, I didn't think about how my blackness would be perceived over the blackness of others. I would not understand that until I was an adult. My entire life, actually just last week I heard something similar. I have been told, oh, but you're not like the average black girl. Not really knowing what that meant, I just thought it was about the fact that I was Jamaican and that made me different. The truth is, people didn't understand how a black girl, any black girl, could walk, talk, and act the way I do. They were taken aback by the way I carried myself because they simply expected less of me, never expecting more. I once thought this, this was a compliment. It's, it somehow said that it was, it somehow told me that I was somehow better than the rest. And I didn't really understand that. But what I came to realize is that, oh, no, no, no. This is an egregious insult. This is not only maligning myself, but it's aligning all black people. I'm ashamed to say that I bought into that compliment at times thinking, well, I am Jamaican, right? So that makes me a little different. In an effort to distance myself from the average. But why should I have to do that? Who made me feel like I had to do that? I'm going to read The Average Black Girl by Ernestine Johnson. And trigger warning, there are a few bad words in here, but I think they were appropriately placed, so I will be speaking them. They say I'm not the average black girl because I'm so well-spoken, poised, full of etiquette, a white man's token. You know, I remember my ex's mother telling me I didn't know how I was going to react when he brought her black girl home, but I like you because you talk so white. But when did talking right equate to talking white? They say, I'm not the average black girl. No, no, not the average black girl, because the pigment of my skin is just a shade lighter than that black girl over there. You know, that black girl over there, the black girl with the nappy hair, the black girl whose elbows can't go a day without lotion, whose hearts and heads are filled with self-hate and bottled up emotion the cocoa brown girls who have to face society every day and be tough because no matter how good they straighten their hair, their good is still not good enough. Oh, but you see, luckily for me, see, I don't fall into that category. See, they say I'm not the average black girl because I speak with so much class and I don't have too much but just enough ass, not too much pizzazz, not, and just a little bit of attitude, because you don't want to come off as rude as one of those average black girls, you know, popping their gum and shaking their neck, because those black girls get no respect. Because the melanin in my skin matches the brown paper, paper bag, and my father and brother and men that I date Pants don't sag. And when I speak, my tongue pronounces every syllable. And the combed part down the middle of my hair is naturally visible. Oh, oh, it must be a weave, or she must be mixed. Because we all know the average black girl ain't got that good shit. Or when I walk into a room full of white men and they stare. It must be the long lengths of my unaveraged black hair. See, see, they say I'm not the average black girl because I can corrected the professor when he used the word conversate, converse, 
the word is converse. And in case you didn't know, there are now eight planets, not nine, in the universe. And when you're watching the numbers on your stocks move up and down, remember Oklahoma in a small town. One of the first Wall Streets was a black Wall Street that got mysteriously burned down. Oh, they say, I'm not the average black girl. Well, let's flip this script and rewind this shit. Repaint the lines that have been blurred over time. Because the average black girl, the average black girl that I know, see, the average black girl that I know made 19 trips through the Underground Railroad to free the slaves, sat on segregated buses, refused to get up, and paved new waves. See, the average black girl I know the average black girl I know were Egyptian queens, like Hatshepsut and Nitocris, who were ruling dynasties and armies of men. Excuse me why I set fire to this poem on my pen, because I am tired, tired of the stereotypes black girls have fallen into because of the American mentality. Oh, but not half as tired as Ella Baker, Diane Nash, Septima Poinsett Clark. I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. Miss Fanny Lou Hammer, Daisy Bates, Anna Arnold, Hedgeman, and Dorothy Hyde are far more tired than I. But do you know, do you think the ones who say I'm not the average black girl give a damn? No. So pardon me if I can't openly accept the compliments. Pardon me if I can't openly accept the compliment. It's just the average black girl that I know, the average black girl that I know, had courage that surpassed every fear and fought for injustice and equality year after year. So as I construct these words, pardon me if I shed a tear, because I'm not, I'm not half the black girl she was. I'm not half the black girl she was. See, there's a minor clause. She was out there fighting, breaking, and changing laws. So I bowed down to my black queen, standing in the merit of her work. And as American society continuously throws these supercilious words onto me, I say no. I am not the average black girl. I can only aspire to be. <laughs> Out of curiosity, who does that resonate with? There are a lot of hands here, a lot of hands. Well, thank you for um, giving me your attention and allowing me to share that with you. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce our CEO, Wendy Carpenter. She's the greatest champion a girl could ever ask for. I mean, Judy Grant, ladies and gentlemen, wow. Um, yeah. Well, good morning, and uh, thank you all for being here at our second annual Rise Up conference, uh, Be a Domino, um, Be the Domino. And I want to give a special thanks to everybody, and especially those of you in the blue shirts today who made today possible. I'm struggling a little bit today. I was so excited to be up here and share with all of you uh, the strides that we've made since our last conference and to really give a message of hope. Um, but my light has been uh, dimmed. Witnessing all the horrors on October 7th um, has left me pretty raw. And seeing the brutality, the hatred, the suffering. And I know that if I'm feeling that way, um, those that are directly affected 
by having loved ones in that region are really suffering today. And I just want you to know that my heart is with you. And I also think that um, for those of us who have been called to this path of helping others and know that we have no choice but to do that, this hits home even more for us. Because our careers, our lives, our, our calling has been seeing suffering. I mean, how many of you out there know what it feels like to see a child that has been brutalized or to even worse, see the lifeless body of a child? So many of us in this field have witnessed uh, families being torn apart. And um, it's hard sometimes to find the hope. And I also uh, want to say that for those that um, are living in fear, here at home, not knowing whether to send their kids to school or go worship, um, or even be in their workplace. Because if they speak the truth in their hearts, they may be discriminated against. And so um, I'm struggling today. We don't get a day off when we are compassionate carers. We don't get a day off when we're healers. We see the suffering and we feel it. And so how do I get up here and say, be the domino, um, especially in times of darkness? And yet I, in my heart, know the answer. And that is what we have always done with each other. And that is to check on people, to check on people and say, are you okay? And to say, I may not know your suffering, but I feel you and I'm here for you and you are not alone. And I say this as Penny Lane be an agency of action, there is a time and a place to take a pause. And as leaders, this can be so difficult because people look to us for a strong message. They look to us for, for leadership and, and what to do next. And I don't have the answers as to what to do next, other than to take a pause. Um, our beautiful Judy Grant, can you imagine being the director of equity and inclusion and speaking against injustice um, and what she has been asked to do in the last week at Penny Lane? And without any direction from me or anybody else, she has done the most important thing we can do, and that is to listen. She went to different staff and she said, how are you feeling? She created the space to have the conversations that needed to be had in an atmosphere that is accepting and loving and one of belonging. I can't say Penny Lane was like that five years ago. It's because of Judy Grant and leading the way and speaking the truth, but in a very kind and compassionate way. And I think the last thing I can say about being the domino is what you've already done today, and that is showing up. This is a tough day to show up to a racial justice conference and know what to say, but you showed up. You didn't turn away. You didn't shut down your hearts. You came here. And I hope that by the end of the day that you do feel a sense of connection and knowing that you're not alone and I just want to thank all of you for choosing love and choosing hope. And we will get through this together. So thank you. I'm also your MC for the day. So um, we have a number of people here from DCFS. Um, I'm very excited that they had a desire to participate, but not just to attend, but to present. We've got a table full of polka dots over here that you will be hearing from later. Um, but I wanted to extend an invitation to Director Nichols, uh, who is the director of DCFS, to come on up and share just a few thoughts. Um, I thought it would be nice to hear from his perspective how what we're doing at Rise Up ties in with what's done at DCFS. Thank you. Wendy. Um, 
I'll be quick. I'm really just here to welcome you, but I was also thinking about the theme of the event, the Be the Domino, and I was going to tell you my domino story because I think it's a pretty good analogy. I remember the exact moment where I got hit in the back of the head with the domino that caused me to fall onto other people. Um, I grew up pretty privileged. A white guy, my family had a little bit of money. Second, uh, two generations of my family did all right. Three generations back, we were in poverty, but I was, I was lucky enough to come into the family at a time when there was a little cash in the pocket. We didn't worry about eating. You know, we had a modest but nice house. Um, I went to law school, and I was pretty, pretty blind to the experience of a lot of people. And that's when I entered into child welfare. So at DCFS, I, I work in child welfare. I've worked in child welfare 25 years. Um, yeah, good. Um, but I didn't, I didn't see all of what was going on around me. And I was invited out to a church. And I want to say it was in Pomona or like right adjacent to Pomona. This is a number of years ago. I'm a little baby guy. Um, I'm, I'm much, much older now. Uh, by a group of black pastors. It was a Kojic church. They wanted to talk to me. I didn't know what they wanted to talk about, but I, I, you know, I'm not going to say no when I get the invitation. And I went out and I sat down at a, a table in that church, and they said to me, they called me Mr. Nichols, I, even though I was a kid, which I thought was a little strange. I mean, young. Um, maybe there's something there as well. But they said, Mr. Nichols, why do you run a racist organization? Um, I, I didn't run it. I, I, I was like a third or fourth level down in DCFS at the time. Um, and, and that was part of my, my initial, my internal reaction was, well, I don't run the place. <laughs> I'm not, I, although now I can't say, I can't say that anymore, but at the, at the time I thought, well, I don't run it. And, and my second reaction honestly was, well, it's not racist. We love people. Like everybody I work with, all the social workers around me, I see them every day. They, they love families. We're, we're not racist. I didn't say that, but I, I will confess today in front of all of you that went through my mind. Um, what I said was, well, I appreciate you sharing that with me. I'm going to go back and take a look at it. And that's what I did. Um, I went back to DCFS headquarters, the big ivory tower, um, and pulled a bunch of data because those are the tools I had. That's the way I approach my work. Um, and I started to look at the data. And it wasn't the conversation that was the domino. It was pulling the data, pulling the data that was the domino that hit me. And I didn't realize it was about to hit me. Uh, but I pulled that data and the experiences of black families and black kids was worse at every point I looked at. Um, the number of calls to the hotline by percentage, the number of social workers who went out and knocked on doors by percentage, the number of kids removed from house by percentage, number of kids placed with relatives in foster care by percentage, number of visitations that happened between siblings, number of kids who reunified with their parents, the time it took to reunify, the time they spent in the system, the time they were adopted at the end if they got adopted, all worse, every single point, I ran a racist organization. That was the domino. Um, I, like, I, it was a, like, oh my God. Um, and I carry that with me today. I remember those numbers. I haven't looked at them in a little bit. I can, probably should refresh them. But I got hit with that domino, and I fell. And I've been trying to push others, not that I'm a great guy, but ever since, to just they, they need to see it too. And so uh, Angela Parks Powell's, Angela, I don't know if you're here. But she and I worked together to present that data to our whole department shortly thereafter. We had to get the word out. Um, and that did start a number. And there were already some things in the work, but it certainly threw fire on a, on a smoldering flame of efforts to do better, efforts to address this, now that we know we couldn't look away. Um, and so that's part of how I end up here. And I guess I just wanted to share that with all of you. Now that you know, you got to do something about it. I mean, you, you, you can't. Pretend like you're ignorant. You can't pretend like you were privileged and blind like I did always before. Some of you probably knew, but um, I. Now you're charged with that knowledge, um, but you being here today means I think you're already starting to fall. The, the, there's there's nobody here that's a standing up totally straight. I think you're at least teetering. You're going to fall and you're going to go out and you're going to hit others, um, and I just want to thank you for that.